Professor Haldane will now give us a third of the series of lectures on unity and diversity. Professor Haldane. At the end of my second lecture, I was given ten written questions, some of them multiple questions. If I had an hour, I could answer them fully. Some of them were not strictly relevant to what I'd been talking about. For example, what is your view of Mahatma Gandhi? Gandhi was far too great a man for me to be able to give my view of him in two minutes. What is your view about religion and the concept of God? These are even greater subjects than Mahatma Gandhi. You have already learned some of my views on the very wide range of topics denoted by the word religion and a still wider range denoted by dharma. And I hope you'll learn some more. I have fairly definite views about one little corner of this vast field. Others have arrived at certitudes which I cannot share about other parts of it. You asked me to speak on God. I cannot make a speech about the unspeakable. But in the ensuing lecture, I shall say something about the relation, as I see it, between small living beings and much greater but still finite beings of which they are parts. A typical question was this. Can we assign a purpose for human life and human society and define a norm if we accept the materialistic interpretation of its origin? If any, what are they? Well, I'm not so conceited as to think that I know the purpose of human life. I know that when one achieves any one kind of virtue or knowledge, one finds ten more tasks of the same kind ahead of one. If we had eliminated such obvious evils this as poverty, war, and disease, I do not know what would appear uh, as our next immediate goals. Now for the word materialistic. I am a materialist, provided I am allowed to consider as matter all that the Sankhya Darshana includes under Prakriti, that is to say, mental as well as physical events. Lenin, who was certainly a materialist, said that the properties of even a single electron were inexhaustible. If this is true, the potentialities of human beings are certainly inexhaustible, and one cannot define a norm for them. Some questions are easier. If all living beings have a common ancestry, are we justified in eating lower species? Holding the views that I do, I have ceased to eat mammals and birds, and shall cease to eat fish when I have a home of my own. But I am not going to lay down rules for others. For 200 years, Englishmen told Indians what to do. It's high time they stopped. <laughs> One more question. You said science will produce life. Will science ever conquer death? I did not say that science will produce life. My exact words were as follows. There is no doubt that men will try to produce life. If this is possible, it will require a technical and intellectual effort, and so on. That is a less confident prophecy. As for the conquest of death, I hope that our descendants may be able to prolong life and healthy life until no one dies before he or she feels ready to do so. It is, I believe, possible for human beings to reach a state in which the word my has no meaning for them. My pain is no more distressing, my this pleasure no more alluring than anyone else's. I have known a few people who approached this state. Some people in India are said to have attained it. For such a person, the phrase, my death, is meaningless. It is generally thought in India that many lives are needed to attain this condition and that to die with unsatisfied desires involves a new birth. I personally venture to doubt this, but I think it is an evil that men should die with unsatisfied desires. I am full of rajas. It might take me a hundred thousand years to shake off all desire and attachment. 
if science can prolong life as long as people desire it and also help them not to desire it once they have fulfilled their duties, then science will have conquered death. Perhaps in answering this question, I have partially answered the question about religion. I regret that I haven't time to answer all the questions, but perhaps what I have just said and what I shall say later may give a notion of how I should have answered the others had time permitted. And here follows the third lecture. A little over a hundred years ago, microscopists discovered that most of the living tissues of plants and animals are divided up into cells. These are rather small. The diameter of a representative cell, human cell, is about a fiftieth of a millimeter or under a thousandth of an inch. However, there are about as many atoms in a human cell as there are cells in a human body. So a cell is a very complicated being. In the last 50 years, it has been found that a single cell can live and reproduce when separated from the rest of the body. It requires very careful treatment, including the provision for the cells of men and higher animals of various chemical compounds found in the blood in just the right quantities. The best proof of the independence of cellular life is that such a tissue culture, as it is called, may go on living long after the animal or plant or human being from which it was taken has died. The progeny of a single cell, from a man or higher animal, may organize themselves into a tissue which carries out some physiological functions. Thus cells from the heart of an embryo chick form mats of tissue which went on contracting rhythmically for many years. In some plants and simple animals, the, cell dis the cells descended from a single cell can regenerate a complete new animal or plant. Those of many animals and plants are too specialized to do so, with one most important exception of which I shall speak in a moment. Every cell includes a nucleus, and this nucleus contains materials which are accurately copied when the nucleus divides. But at other times, the atoms in them are much less frequently replaced by new atoms from the food than are those in other parts of the cell. Most of the hereditary characters of living beings depend on this part of the nucleus. It consists in part of what are called genes, which control different processes for example, the production of coloring matter in flowers, animal hair or silk, or the growth of horns in cattle or horns in rice. This Genes also determine the needs of a plant or animal. Some rice plants will only grow well in deep water. No British cattle will thrive in Indian hot weather. The aggregate of genes is called the genome. It might be called the Svadharma for it determines the needs of a plant or animal and its possible performance. Sexual reproduction involves the formation of special cells called gametes, each of which has lost half its genome or svadharma. A small cell of this kind produced by a male penetrates a larger one produced by a female. They constitute a new cell with a complete svadharma, which then divides, grows, and becomes a new plant or animal. Sometimes, as with most fish and frogs, this union takes place in water. More usually, it takes place inside the mother. The embryo may be born at once before it is properly formed, or it may be nourished by the mother for a long time, and only start independent life when it has reached a considerable size, for example, a calf or a coconut. I have tried to compress into five minutes the main results of some centuries of work by tens of thousands of men and women. Obviously, they raise the most profound philosophical problems. 
on a few of which I will touch later. Let me raise just one now. A cell is certainly alive. Is a gene alive? I lost my hair before I was 30 because the cells in my scalp contained a gene causing premature baldness which can either be called a descendant of a similar gene in my father or a remote but accurate copy of it. Let us consider a parallel case. One learns the Gayatri Mantra from an older man who learned it from as a boy. It has been transmitted by copying in this way for at least a hundred human generations, perhaps many more. But the Gayatri Mantra has also been said to be a goddess with a life of her own. Both these statements seem to me to have an element of truth, though I do not believe the second quite literally. Probably the most surprising fact about genetics is that the same principles hold for plants and animals. Most of the principles discovered by Mendel in his study of the pea can be applied to animals. Linkage, which enables us to locate genes on chromosomes, was first discovered in plants and only later in animals, including human beings. Only three years ago, my wife was able to study for the first time the inheritance of characters when an animal is self-fertilized and found that it was precisely the same as with self-fertilized plants. This similarity is due to the remarkably similar organization of the nucleus and particularly of its division in most plants and animals. It is not the only possible organization for a few plants and animals have a rather different one. And in bacteria, the organization is simpler and crude. There just isn't room for the whole of the cell nuclear dividing machinery of a, an ordinary cell in a single bacteria. However, the usual type of nuclear mechanism is so complicated that it points very strongly to a common ancestry of plants and animals. The same argument, of course, works conversely. Thus, vertebrates, insects, and cuttlefish all have good eyes, but with three different basic planes, from which it is argued that they were independently evolved from eyeless ancestors. There are many other reasons for believing this. To a geneticist like myself, the similarity of plant and animal genetics is a strong argument for the unity of descent of animals and plants. Let us now consider another set of biological facts. When we say that a man is an individual, we mean that he cannot be divided in such a way that both parts will go on living. If you divide him at a finger joint, the main part survives and the small one dies, though it may be possible to keep a bit of it alive in tissue culture, but at a low level of life, so to say. If you divide a man in two at the neck, both halves die, with the same reservation. But now, think of a cultivated banana tree. Is it is constantly putting up new stems, or suckers, as they are called, from its roots. If left to itself, the original plant will die and leave a circle of descendants round it. But we may cut the root before this has happened and replant the tiny tree. I say that the banana tree is a dividual. This is quite a respectable English word. It's used with a rather different meaning in Milton's Paradise Lost. Now, few animals are dividuals when adults. But some worms are so. 
as are the polyps which make coral. However, human beings and many other animals are dividuals at a very early stage. A fertilized egg cell may divide into two halves, each giving rise to a twin. Such twins are not only of the same sex, but very like one another in build and character, for they have the same genome, or Svadharma. Most plants are dividuals. Even rice, which is normally grown from seed, can be divided up and the pieces transplanted. Of course, cultivated bananas yield no seed, so they can only be reproduced by division or, as it is often called, vegetative reproduction. As none of the genome is lost in this process, plants so reproduced have the same svadharma, the same capacities and the same needs as their parents. But men have treated some dividual plants in a very strange way. Mango trees are constantly growing from seed and most of them produce very stringy fruits not worth eating. However, occasionally one bears good fruit. Such a tree can be multiplied by grafting. A twig from it is grafted onto the root from another seedling, and the two healed together to form a new organism which has a physiological unity, even though its parts were grown a hundred miles apart. Insects and even frogs of different species can be grafted together as pupae or embryos. But if a bit of skin is grafted from one human being to another, for example, to help in the healing of a serious burn, it lives for some weeks and then dies. The only human tissue which can survive when grafted from one man to another is what is called the cornea, the transparent window in front of the eye. This can be removed even a few hours after death and used to replace one which has become opaque through disease or injury. Some, but unfortunately not very many, cases of blindness can be cured in this way. The transplanted part is not dead, like a piece of glass, but consists of living cells which are nourished by their new host. We see then that some living organisms can be divided into two and others can be joined together to make a new one. Presumably, the great philosophers of India were vaguely aware of such facts, though it seems that tree grafting was introduced to India by Europeans. But I don't think the philosophers this saw the interest the of these things. Had they done so, the banana tree would have been a familiar example like the rope and snake or the smoke on the mountainside. I should particularly like to have read Nagarjuna's comments on the propagation of banana trees. However, I want to point out that these facts are very important for Indian economics. It may be possible to divide a coconut palm or narikel tree, perhaps by growing another from its roots. If so, it will be possible to pick out the most fruitful trees in such, such states as Kerala and West Bengal and to propagate others as like them as the various members of a named variety of mango or banana are like another. There are theoretical reasons why this may be very difficult in the case of palm trees. It may turn out to be impossible. But with mangoes, I believe real progress can and should be made in 10 years. 30 years ago, we propagated apples in England much as mangoes are propagated in India today. Provided the upper part of the partnership was known to produce good fruit, nobody worried about the rootstock as the lower part is called. Then, the workers at East Malling in Kent 
again to select rootstocks and to propagate them vegetatively. Now we can buy rootstocks immune to various diseases. We can also choose one which is known to agree with the scion or fruiting part of the compound tree. For sometimes the two are incompatible. But above all, we can choose a stock on which a tall tree will grow or a dwarfing stock, which will give a nice little tree eight or ten feet high and bearing fruit after two or three years suited to a suburban garden. My neighbours at Baranagar, just north of Calcutta, mostly have tiny gardens with no room for a mango tree of the usual size. It may be just as easy to make dwarf trees for them as it has been to make dwarf apple trees in England. I mention these facts because some of you may think that I have been talking about matters of no practical importance. If you enunciate a scientific principle without seeing any practical value in it, that probably means that you don't really understand the principle. I want to go back now for a moment to genetics. Within a species, such as cattle or rice, every animal or plant is different. I do not say every individual because a rice plant is not an individual and even a cow, as we saw, is a cooperative commonwealth as regards the di digestion of grass, though an individual as regards the production of milk. Some of the differences within a species are genetically determined and often, but not always, inherited. And there are breeds of cattle and rice whose members are fairly similar. One might ask, is not one breed better than the others and should it not replace them? Now this is a fair question to ask about some manufactured goods. For example, the best safety razor blade is the one which gives you most shaves for a rupee. And no doubt, the best rice is that which gives you most mons per acre if you're not interested in its scent and protein content. But which sort will give most morns depends on when and where you sow your rice. And of all the crop plants which I know, rice is the most diverse. For the whole of India, about 40 or 50 varieties of wheat are officially recommended. In any of the climates of India and on any of the soils, one or other of these will probably give the highest yield. But after testing over 4,000 varieties of rice, the Central in Rice Institute recommended nearly 500. Some varieties are suited to upland soils which dry quickly after the rains. Others will grow in water even 20 feet deep. There are plants suited for different times of year. But those which flower after the rains and are reaped in November or December flower when the night reaches a certain length. At the Central Rice Institute at Katak, someone erected an electric lamp post by the side of a plot of Aman Paddy. I saw that the plants near it had not flowered except where a metal support had thrown a shadow. In plants which can be grown in pots, in artificial light, turned on and off without reference to the sun, it has been shown that it is the length of night, not of day, which counts. I don't know if this experiment has been done on rice. It is a rather striking demonstration of the unity of life that the development of the reproductive organs and the desire to migrate in some mammals and birds also depends on day length. An extra two or three hours of light will induce some European mammals such as the ferret, which resembles a mongoose, to breed in January instead of March. And birds 
which are given some extra hours of strong light in the evening, do not migrate southwards in autumn if given the chance. Now on the same day in late October, a night will be longer in Assam than in Andhra, longer in Andhra than in Kerala. So we need different varieties of rice if they are to flower on the same day in these three states. In spite of this diversity, there is a sense in which all the rice plants in India have a unit. <coughs> By careful crossing, one can transfer a character such as resistance to blast disease or sensitivity to night length from one variety to another because it depends on one gene or a small number of genes. It is much harder to transfer desirable characters from Japanese to Indian rice as the hybrids are past, partly sterile. And of course, one cannot combine the desirable characters in two banana trees. By becoming sterile, bananas have lost this kind this of unity. Radio As a geneticist, I am intensely interested in diversity, especially when it is inherited. That is why I found the thousands of rice varieties which I was shown at the Central Rice Institute at Cuttack last October, the most exciting spectacle that I have seen in India this year. But diversity is only valuable provided each plant and animal can fulfill its svadharma. Otherwise, it may be a nuisance. My wife has just started research on tassar silk moths. She bought a batch of 640 cocoons in a market in Bihar. Not only were they unequal in size and silk yield, but the silks were of several different colors, and so were the moths which came out of the cocoons. Even if it is unexpectedly difficult to improve the yield, it should be quite easy to produce silk of a uniform color, and this should at least make slightly better cloth than an unpredictable mixture. However, I am not here to lecture on possible applications of genetics in India. I do not know enough yet to do so. I shall go back to the kind of unity which prevails in a highly developed and individual organism such as a man, a bee, or a palm tree. Even before the discovery of cells, it was clear that these organisms consisted of different parts which grew up to form a pattern and which collaborated together. However, very different views were taken as to the nature of this collaboration and of the kind of unity achieved. At one end of the scale, some thought that every detail was regulated by the soul or jivatman associated with the living matter. At the other end, it was thought that a full explanation could be given in terms of the interaction of atoms. There are serious objections to the first view. I certainly do not regulate the details of my digestion, hair growth, and so on consciously. Perhaps it has been thought an unconscious part of my soul or mind does so. Perhaps I contain several souls with different functions. The case of the mango is very awkward for such a theory. Here, it would seem that a life or soul had been cut in two and then two lives or souls fused. If you think you are a living body, a living being, and the mango only a machine, remember the men who are seeing today 
with parts of other men's eyes. But the interpretation in terms of atomic interactions is at least equally difficult, particularly since physicists now realize that even such a simple atomic property as mass is what is called a cooperative phenomenon depending on an atom's neighbors as well as on itself. When we compare a li live plant or animal with a machine, we find some close analogies. In particular, the amount of work or heat which a man or dog can produce from sugar, fat, or many other foods is exactly the same as can be got from burning it. And the successive steps in its utilization can be imitated very exactly in non-living systems. The attempt to explain the details of bodily processes in terms of physics and chemistry is being very actively pursued and with complete success. The most striking feature of a living being is, however, its capacity for self-regulation. The most obvious example is healing. Torn skin mends itself, torn clothes do not. And this self-regulation turns out to be the main end to which all bodily activities are directed. There are, of course, machines which regulate some of their activities, for example, thermostats. But it is difficult to imagine a machine which regulated them all. Perhaps such a machine would be alive. I do not know. I want to consider one activity which is common to many animals, namely breathing. <coughs> I do not mean the uptake of oxygen, but the rhythmical intake and output of air or water. This is certainly necessary for life in higher animals, and primitive human thinkers all over the world identified breath with life and even with mental functions. Such words as prana, atman, spirit, all meant breath originally. When oxygen was discovered and was found to unite with other substances in flames, it was thought that the function of breathing was to supply oxygen to the vital flame. This is true, but it is not the whole truth. Over 50 years ago, my father made the surprising discovery that the breathing is so regulated as to keep the amount of carbon dioxide in the blood supplied by the heart to the other organs remarkably steady. If you walk at four miles per hour, you will increase your production of carbon dioxide by a, per minute to about three times what it was when you were lying down. But the amount in the blood only rises by about 5% because your increased breathing very nearly, but not completely, compensates for the rise. Again, if you over-breathe voluntarily for some minutes like this, <sighs> <coughs> you will lower the carbon dioxide in your blood and you may neither breathe nor want to breathe for a minute or more. This is all in your the breathing is not normally regulated by want of oxygen, as you can easily prove by breathing pure oxygen, which doesn't slow your breathing down. Only when the oxygen in the air breathe fall, uh, falls quite low is there any serious increase in the breathing. A yogi performing pranayana does not suffer from oxygen want, but produces rhythmical changes in the level of carbon dioxide in his organs 
which seem to have remarkable effects. Carbon dioxide is a necessity of life. As we normally make more than we need, we are constantly getting rid of it, but we cannot live without it. In the same way, the kidneys do not merely serve to get rid of waste products. They can hold salt back most tenaciously if it has been lost through sweating. Hunger and thirst are feelings generated by abnormal composition of the blood. If you inject some strong salt solution into a man, he will feel thirsty long before his mouth has got dry. Breathing is important because the amounts of carbon dioxide and oxygen in our blood change very quickly as a result of chemical events in the body's cells. So we cannot survive for five minutes without breathing. The amounts of other substances change much more slowly, so a man can survive for several days without kidneys or without drinking. Most organic regulation is done quite unconsciously. We do not normally notice our breathing or the repairs which are constantly going on all over our bodies. If an organ increases its use of oxygen, for example, when a muscle contracts or a gland secretes, a very simple automatic mechanism increases its blood supply and the pressure in the arteries would fall if we did not possess pressure gauges which signal to the heart for an increase of blood flow. The central government in the brain no more interferes than the government at Delhi interferes with the traffic signals in Calcutta. We might say that the constituents of our body enjoy a good deal of freedom. Even those which are most obviously under control the voluntary muscles are very far from slaves. At first sight, the nerve connecting a muscle to the central nervous system seems merely to transmit orders to the muscle. But in fact, it has been found that only a minority of the fibers in the nerves leading to many muscles are doing this. Others are transmitting reports back from the muscle to the central nervous system and quite a number are regulating the organs in the muscle which send these reports back. Without such a system, the muscles could never act with the astonishing precision needed, for example, in skilled human work or in the flight of birds. This is all India radio we see then that a living being consists of a very large number of living constituents, the cells, which are organized in, into further systems which act as holes, such as muscles or glands. These have a good deal of autonomy, and even when they are closely controlled, they can, and do, answer back. The analogy with a state is obvious though it is dangerous to press it too far. But if we make the comparison, we must realize that the kind of state which is most like a living body is one in which there is a great deal of freedom and criticism of the central authority. A pain may be compared to such a criticism. It can force the central authority to drop other activities and try to deal with the cause of the pain. I mention one curious analogy. The Prime Minister wishes the central government to take over various activities, such as steel making, which have so far been left to private enterprise. He also practices yoga. That is to say, he has learned to control 
some of the activities in his own body which most people leave to control themselves. Now yoga leads to an extension of consciousness as well as of will. It may lead to the experience of kundalini which is said to be a higher level of self-consciousness. Socialistic planning is impossible without very detailed economic knowledge. The Indian Statistical Institute, where I work, is an organ providing knowledge of a kind which does not exist in many other states. One of the most striking discoveries of physiology is the way in which antagonistic processes achieve a regulation which apparently cannot be achieved in any other way. What happens, for example, when you straighten your arm which was previously bent at the elbow? The muscles in the upper arm above the elbow such as the triceps become shorter and thicker as you can easily feel. At the same time, the stronger muscles which bend the elbow, such as the biceps, relax. But they do not relax completely. If they did, you might straighten your arm so violently as to dislocate your elbow. In fact, both sets of muscles are pulling to some extent. And the same is true all over your body. This keeps you in a steady posture but uses up a good deal of energy. If the muscles relaxed completely, you would need appreciably less food. This apparently wasteful antagonism or struggle of opposites is entirely characteristic of the bodies of higher animals. It also occurs on the biochemical level. For example, the thyroid gland in the neck produces several chemical substances containing iodine, which are needed by most other tissues. If there is a shortage of these hormones, as they are called, the resting heat production goes down and one becomes fat and sluggish. If there is too much, the heat production goes up and one becomes thin and over irritable. If the thyroid has been removed, one can keep a man in good health by giving him the right amount daily. On the other hand, one can give half of this amount, or perhaps a little more, to a normal man without any appreciable effect. That's a very curious fact, but let us see why it is so. The amount in the blood is carefully regulated. The activity of the thyroid gland is controlled in turn by the thyrotrophic hormone produced in the pituitary gland between the brain and the roof of the mouth. If the amount of thyroid hormone falls, a lot of thyrotrophic hormone is poured into the blood and the thyroid is stimulated to make more of its own hormone. If the amount of thyroid hormone in the blood rises, the pituitary ceases to make thyrotrophic hormone. Now, if a physician thinks too mechanistically, he may hope to restore health by injecting one or another of two hormones interacting in this way. This but it may have no effect at all or the opposite effect of what was intended. For example, the testis, the male sex gland, pours hormones into the blood which make a human beard or a cock's comb grow and have many other effects. It might be thought, and it was at one time suggested, that deficient virility could be restored 
by injecting plenty of this hormone. On the contrary, you can castrate a male animal by doing so, for one of its effects is to stop the production by the pituitary gland of a hormone which is needed for the function of the testes. I could multiply examples indefinitely. I want you to believe that at every level stability is achieved by conflict of this kind. Such a system is far more elastic against external influences than such a rigid system as most man-made machines. A good deal of what we take to be evil in human societies and in the universe is one side of such a conflict. We human beings are seldom wise enough to see that the conflict is part of a large-scale pattern. Lenin, in particular, stressed the necessity of conflict for progress. I am sure that many of you who have listened to these lectures have been disappointed. You hope, perhaps, that I would enunciate some great principle. At best, I have only convinced you that life is more complicated than you imagine. If I had stressed the unity of life, I could have given a so-called holistic account. Such an account may stop at the individual and present men and animals as isolated units, or it may go further and regard them as mere components in a state or pawns in a divine game of chess. Or I could have stressed details and tried to explain life in terms of the properties of atoms. Either treatment can achieve an intellectual coherence which I have missed. And it is desirable that these views should be developed, for both are fruitful. But I think that a more dialectical view, to use the Marxist phraseology, is somewhat nearer to the truth. Some of you may get an inkling of my point of view by contemplating one of the temples which are among the glories of India. At each moment, one's mind is torn between the appreciation of the building as a whole and the appreciation of its details. Our European cathedrals of the Middle Ages produce the same conflict. Some people find the conflict exhausting or intolerable and prefer buildings with less ornament or pictures and sculptures in a gallery with no overriding aesthetic plan. In conclusion, I wish to make it clear that I am not preaching a new philosophy or a new religion. No doubt I have inadvertently told you some untruths. But most of what I have told you is, I believe, strictly true. And I believe that some of it is so important that it will have to be incorporated into any philosophy or religion which is to command the assent of intelligent men and women. Of course, the facts can be expressed in different words. Some of you may think I have not been materialistic enough, others that I have been too materialistic. Anyone who has been influenced by the Sankhya Darshana will hesitate to make such a criticism. For him or her, a mountain or a flame, and my perception of it, and emotions about it, are equally Prakriti, though they are different kinds of Prakriti. For the adherents of other darshanas, they are equally illusory. I also think that the point of view which I have tried to put forward may help to suggest how some of the practical problems 
which confront India may be solved. Let me give you just one example. The various plants and animals in a natural community, such as a jungle, form a unity which possesses a certain stability. If, for example, men kill off carnivorous animals, such as wolves and tigers, this is all India radio the numbers radio. of vegetarian animals, such as deer, may increase until they actually die of famine and of diseases due to overcrowding. This process has been observed on several occasions in North America. Agriculture upsets this balance, giving a plant community or a plant and animal community, such as a paddy field or a cow pasture, which is more easily disturbed by natural causes such as drugs and epidemics than a natural community such as the jungle. And although it gives a higher yield to men than the natural community, it may not exploit the soil so well. One of the subjects on which I want to get research started here is that of mixed crops. There is evidence, for example, that a field sown with a mixture of about equal parts of wheat and gram will grow more than half as much wheat as if it were planted with wheat only and also more than half as much gram. Unfortunately, this evidence is not as strong as could be desired. We may suggest that the wheat and gram plants are cooperating or that they are extracting rather different substances from the soil. Clearly, such a field is a little more like a natural plant community than is a field sown with wheat or gram alone. It may be a little more useful to men. Certainly, it is more trouble to reap and it is quite unsuitable for mechanical reaping. But as India has little or no mechanization of agriculture and a large rural labor force, it is worth considering. I am hoping that the Indian Statistical Institute may take up once more the investigation of mixed crops, which Professor Mahala Nobish started 15 years ago, but was then prevented from completing. Rice is rarely, if ever, grown along with anything else. But Gustafsson's work on barley in Sweden suggests that if a mixture of two different varieties of rice is grown in the same field, the yield will sometimes be higher than that of either alone. This again is, of course, a matter for statistical investigation. I give these two examples out of many in the hope of persuading you that the consideration of the, university, uh, of the unity and diversity of life is not only an activity of a certain philosophical and cultural value. It is immediately applicable to concrete biological problems, problems which are quite literally matters of life and death to millions of Indians. I have done my best to discuss life rather than mind or spirit. I have not said, for example, either that each cell in my body is or is not controlled by a jivat man or that my body as a whole is or is not so controlled. Nor have I preached any ethical doctrine. But anyone who has the concrete and detailed notion of the unity of life at which I have perhaps arrived after studying biology for 60 years, will at least have some respect for all life, including plant life. 
One of the many sights which depresses me in India is that of the millions of mutilated Kajur palms. Many of them slowly dying. It's very pleasant in and around Delhi to see Kajur palms which have not been so mutilated. I don't think that these trees feel pain, but pain is certainly not the only evil and perhaps not the most serious evil. On the walls of the large room in the zoological laboratory at Münster in Germany, where Professor Wrench keeps living animals, are written the words Tatvam Asi. If I have helped any of you to understand some of the implications of this great saying, my lectures have not been in vain. Any questions? Any questions?